Good evening, mateys. Time for chapter 15 of Treasure Island, The Man of the Island. Now this is a bit of a different chapter. Jim, who's been running away from Long John Silver and the other pirates after they've killed two of the loyal men on board, runs towards the hills away from the pirates and suddenly he stops because he hears something. What he hears is a man <clears throat> and the man turns out to be another pirate but an old pirate who's been marooned on the island for the past three years. He's been alone on the island living by himself on what he could hunt and catch and gather. So he looks a little strange. His story, he's going to tell his story and I'll try to explain some of the things as we go along. From the side of the hill, which was here steep and stony, a spout of gravel was dislodged and fell rattling and bounding through the trees. My eyes turned instinctively in that direction, and I saw a figure leap with great rapidity behind the trunk of a pine. What it was, whether bear or man or monkey, I could in no wise tell. It seemed dark and shaggy. More I knew not, but the terror of this new apparition brought me to a stand. An apparition is something that appears. I was now, it seemed, cut off upon both sides. He had the pirates behind him and ahead of him this new, this new unknown person. He says, behind me the murderers, before me this lurking nondescript. And immediately I began to prefer the dangers that I knew to those I knew not. Silver himself appeared less terrible in contrast with this creature of the woods, and I turned on my heel, and looking sharply behind me over my shoulder, began to retrace my steps in the direction of the boats. Instantly the figure reappeared, and making a wide circuit, began to head me off. I was tired, at any rate, but had I been as fresh as when I rose or when I woke up, I could see it was in vain for me to contend in speed with such an adversary, meaning he couldn't run as fast as this man of the island. From trunk to trunk of the trees, the creature flitted like a deer, running manlike on two legs, but unlike any man that I'd ever seen, stooping almost double as it ran. Yet, a man it was. I could no longer be in doubt about that. I began to recall what I'd heard of cannibals. Now, you all know what cannibals are. I was within an ace of hall calling for help. But the mere fact that he was a man, however wild, had somewhat reassured me, and my fear of silver began to revive in proportion, meaning... He began to be, be more afraid of Long John Silver than of this new creature. I stood still, therefore, and cast about for some method of escape. And as I was so thinking, the recollection of my pistol flashed into my mind. As soon as I remembered I was not defenseless, courage glowed again in my heart and I set my face resolutely for this man of the island and walked briskly towards him. <clears throat> that was brave of him. He was concealed by this time behind another tree trunk, but he must have been watching me closely, for as soon as I began to move in his direction, he reappeared and took a step to meet me. Then he hesitated, drew back, came forward again, and at last, to my wonder and confusion, threw himself on his knees and held out his clasped hands in supplication. At that, I once more stopped. Who are you? 
I asked. Ben Gunn, he answered, and his voice sounded hoarse and awkward like a rusty lock. I'm poor Ben Gunn, I am, and I haven't spoken with a Christian these three years. I could now see that he was a white man like myself, meaning he was a European and not one of the, an, an Indian from, uh, from America, of one of the native population, and that his features were even pleasing. His skin, wherever it was exposed, was burnt by the sun. Even his lips were black, and his fair eyes looked quite startling in so dark a face. Of all the beggar men that I had seen or fancied, he was the chief for raggedness. He was clothed with tatters of old ship's canvas, meaning parts of the sails, and old sea cloth, and this extraordinary patchwork was all held together by a system of the most various and incongruous fastenings, brass buttons, bits of stick, and loops of tarry gaskin. Now, gaskins turn out to be leggings. About his waist, he wore an old brass buckled leather belt, which was the one thing solid in his whole accoutrement. Accoutrement was a word that actually used to mean the uniform and the equipment that were given to a soldier, but it's come to mean the, uh, all of the things that a person carries and wears. Three years, I cried. Were you shipwrecked? Nay, mate, says he, marooned. Now, marooned means you were left alone on an island. I'd heard the word, and I knew it stood for a horrible kind of punishment, common enough among the buccaneers, in which the offender is put ashore with a little powder and shot and left behind on some desolate and distant island. I remember every every rifle or gun that a person had in those days had you had to put powder in it and you had to put a bullet in it the bullet is called shot and powder is powder it was gunpowder marooned three years agone he continued and lived on goats since then and berries and oysters wherever a man is says i a man can do for himself so he was able to live, but he was self-sufficient. He could make a live, he could make, find a way to keep alive on this desert island. He could find food and shelter. But mate, my heart is sore for Christian diet. You mightn't happen to have a piece of cheese about you now? No? Well, many's the long night I've dreamed of cheese toasted mainly, and woke up again, and here I were. If ever I can get on board again, said I, you shall have cheese by the stone. The stone is a unit of weight, like three or four or five pounds. All this time he'd been feeling the stuff of my jacket, smoothing my hands, looking at my boots, and generally, in the intervals of his speech, showing a childish pleasure in the presence of a fellow creature. Don't forget, he hadn't seen anyone in three years, no other person, only goats and oysters. But at my last words, he perked up into a kind of startled slyness. If ever you can get aboard again, says you, he repeated, why now, who's to hinder you? Who's to keep you from getting on board? Not you, I know, was my reply. And right you was, he cried. Now, you, what do you call yourself, mate? Jim, I told him. Jim, Jim, says he, quite pleased, apparently. Well now, Jim, I've lived that rough as you'd be ashamed to hear of. Now, for instance, 
You wouldn't think I'd had a pious mother to look at me, he asked. A pious mother means a mother who was religious, who observed the laws and the commandments. Why, no, not in particular, I answered. Ah, well, said he, but I had remarkable pious, and I was a civil, pious boy, and could rattle off my catechism that fast as you couldn't tell one word from another. The catechism is a question-and-answer way of teaching the principles of a religion, and because he was Christian, catechism means the principles of Christianity. And here's what it come to, Jim. Here's what it come to. I'm here alone on an island. And it begun with Chuck Farthen on the blessed gravestones. Now, Chuck Farthen turns out to be a game. Chuck means to throw or toss. And a farthen is a farthing or a, a small coin, an English coin, worth one quarter of a penny. Now, a quarter of a penny is not very much. We don't have a coin like that. Yeah, something like something like ten agarot would be a farthing, and probably worth about as much. On the blessed, so the game is you throw the you you throw the far the coins at a mark, and the person who gets the closest to the mark gets to take all the coins that have been thrown and throw them into a hole. If he can get them into the little hole, he gets to keep what he has, what he's, what he's thrown into the hole, and the rest goes back to whoever threw it. That's what it begun with, but it went further than that. And so my mother told me and predicted the hole. She did, the pious woman. But it were providence that put me here. I've thought it all out on this here lonely island, and I'm back on piety. You don't catch me tasting rum so much. But just a thimbleful for luck, of course, the first chance I have. I'm bound I'll be good, and I see the way to. And Jim, looking all around him and lowering his voice to a whisper, I'm rich. I now felt sure that the poor fellow had gone crazy in his solitude, and I supposed I must have shown the feeling in my face, for he repeated the statement hotly. Rich, rich, I says, and I'll tell you what, I'll make a man of you, Jim. Ah, <laughs> Jim, you'll bless your stars, you will. You was the first that found me. And at this, there came suddenly a lowering shadow over his face. He got worried, and he tightened his grasp upon my hand and raised a forefinger threateningly before my eyes. Now, Jim, you tell me true. That ain't Flint's ship, he asked. At this, I had a happy inspiration. I began to believe that I'd found an ally, a friend, someone to help me, and I answered him at once. It's not Flint's ship, and Flint is dead, but I'll tell you true, as you ask me, there are some of Flint's hands aboard. Worse luck for the rest of us. Not a man with one leg, he gasped. Silver, I asked. Ah, Silver, says he, that were his name. He's the cook and the ringleader, too. He was still holding me by the wrist, and at that he gave it quite a ring. If you was sent by Long John, he said, I'm as good as pork, meaning I'm as good as dead, and I know it. But where was you, do you suppose? I had made my mind up in a moment, and by way of answer, told him the whole story of our voyage and the predicament in which we found ourselves. 
He heard me with the keenest interest, and when I had done, he patted me on the head. You're a good lad, Jim, he said, and you're all in a clove hitch, ain't you? Now, a clove hitch is a kind of a knot. I, I have one here. I made one beforehand. Sailors use knots all the time, and they use hitches. When you want to tie something quickly so that it won't come loose, you use a hitch because you can undo it right away also. It undoes, it's, you can be undone quickly, unlike a knot, which you kind of have to put, pick apart or cut off. That's a clove hitch. If you ever look up knots in the dictionary, you'll see there are dozens of them. Different kind of knots for different kind of things. But when he says you're in a clove hitch, he means you're in a lot of trouble. I told him the squire was the most liberal of men. I, but you see, returned Ben Gunn, I didn't mean giving me a gate to keep and a shoot of livery clothes and such. That's not my mark, Jim. What I mean is, would he be likely to come down to the tune of, uh, say, 1,000 pounds out of money that's as good as a man's own already? Meaning Ben Gunn wants to buy his, buy his passage home and he has the money to buy it with. That's what he's telling us. He doesn't want to be a servant to Squire, uh, Squire Trelawney. He doesn't want to work at the, be the gatekeeper of Squire Trelawney's mansion. He wants to pay for his way home. I'm sure he would, said I. As it was, all hands were to share. Everyone was to get a share of the treasure. And a passage home, he added, with a look of great shrewdness. Why, I cried, the squire is a gentleman. And besides, if we get rid of the others, we should want you to help work the vessel home. They need crew. They need people to man the ship. Ah, said he, so you would. And he seemed very much relieved. Now, I'll tell you what, he went on. So much I'll tell you and no more. I were in Flint's ship when he buried the treasure. He and six along, six strong seamen, they went ashore, all Flint and six seamen, to bury the treasure. They were ashore nigh on a week. And us standing off and on in the old walrus. You remember the walrus is the name of Captain Flint's pirate ship. One fine day, up went the signal, and here come Flint by himself in a little boat, and his head done up in a blue scarf. The sun was getting up, and mortal white he looked about the cutwater. But there he was, you mind. And the six all dead, dead and buried. How he done it, not a man aboard us could make out. It was battle, murder, and sudden death, leastwise. Him against six, Billy Bones was the mate. Long John, he was quartermaster. And they asked him where the treasure was. Ah, says he, you can go ashore if you like and stay, he says. But as for the ship, she'll beat up for more by thunder. That's what he said, meaning the ship, the walrus, he was going to leave. He left the treasure on Treasure Island and the ship he was going to take out and do more pirating. Well, I was in another ship three years back. And we sighted this island. Boys, said I, here is Flint's treasure. Let's land and find it. The captain was displeased at that. But my messmates were all of a mind and landed. So the captain didn't want to stop for that. But the crew decided they wanted to look for buried treasure. Twelve days they looked for it. And every day they had the worst word for me. 
because every day they couldn't find it and they couldn't find it and they were digging and working hard and after a while they just got very upset with Ben Gunn until one fine morning all hands went aboard. As for you, Benjamin Gunn, they says, here's a musket, a gun, they says, and a spade, a shovel, and a pickaxe, something to dig with. You can stay here and find Flint's money for yourself, they says. So they left him, they marooned him. Well, Jim, three years have I been here and not a bite of Christian diet from that day to this. But now you look here, look at me. Do I look like a man before the mast? Am I an ordinary seaman? No, says you. No, I weren't neither, I says. Well, but he doesn't tell us who, what he was on that ship. With that, he winked and pinched me hard. He pinched. Just you mention them words to your squire, Jim, he went on. Nor he weren't neither. That's the words. Three years he were the man of this island. Light and dark, fair and rain. That means day and night. Whether the weather was good or whether it was rainy, Ben Gunn, was the only man on the island. He was the man of this island. And sometimes he would, he's talking about himself, sometimes he would, maybe, think upon a prayer, says you. And sometimes he would, maybe, think of his old mother. So be as she's alive, you'll say. But the most part of Gunn's time, this is what you'll say, the most part of his time was took up with another matter. And then you'll give him a nip, like I do. And he pinched me again in the most confidential manner. Then he continued, then you'll up and you'll say this, Gunn is a good man, you'll say. And he puts a precious sight more confidence, a precious sight, mind that, in a gentleman born than in these gentlemen of fortune, having been one himself. Meaning, a gentleman board means a man who was born into a family who had land and who had money. A gentleman of fortune, as you'll remember, is a pirate. Well, I said, I don't understand one word that you've been saying, but that's neither here nor there. For how am I to get on board? Ah, said he, that's the hitch for sure. Well, here's my boat that I made with my two hands. I keep her under the white rock. If the worst comes to the worst, we might try that after dark. Hi, he broke out, what's that? For just then, although the sun had still an hour or two to run, meaning it was still daylight for another hour or two, all the echoes of the island awoke and bellowed to the thunder of a cannon. They've begun to fight, I cried. Follow me. <clears throat> and I began to run towards the anchorage, my terrors all forgotten, while close at my side, the maroon man in his goatskins trotted easily and lightly. Left, left, says he. Keep to your left hand, mate, Jim. Under the trees with you. Oh, over there, that's where I killed my first goat. They don't come down here now. They're all mast-headed on them mountings for the fear of Benjamin Gunn. Means now all the goats that lived on the island before, they weren't afraid. Now they're afraid and they of Ben Gunn, so they stay up on the heights where he can't come after them. Ah, and there's the cemetery, uh, cemetery, he must have meant. You see the mounds? I come here and prayed nows and thens, when I thought maybe a Sunday would be about due. It weren't quite a chapel, but it seemed more solemn-like. And then, says you, Ben Gunn was short-handed, no chaplain, no priest, no no rabbi, no no minister, 
nor so much as a Bible and a flag, you says. So he kept talking as I ran, neither expecting nor receiving any answer, just happy to be talking. The cannon shot was followed after a considerable interval by a volley of small arms, meaning pistols and, gun and muskets. Another pause, and then, not a quarter of a mile in front of me, I beheld the Union Jack flutter in the air above a wood. That's the end of the chapter. The Union Jack is the British flag, and you've probably seen that. You might not recognize it, but it's red, blue, and white. With You'll see it. That's the end of the chapter, and we'll pick it up another time.